A Glance in the Mirror Chapter 22 Wartime Education Elsie took Terry on his first day to Longfield Primary School in September 1940. After this initiation he walked with his brother until he could remember the route. Over thirty children were in the induction class, all sitting on tiny seats in front of tiny desks, the whole room in keeping with the furniture, all in a Lilliputian scale. As well as recognising letters and numbers, the class were taught how to sew with very blunt needles, how to paint and sing. On the window sills, boxes of wet flannel grew mustard and cress. Jam jars lined with blotting paper demonstrated the growth of peas and beans. Terry took to it all immediately. All his fears evaporated, so did his cap, never to be replaced. Throughout his school days, the uniform was the same, jacket and trousers. He never had a great coat or raincoat. The jacket had to suffice. It was the same for all his friends. The class were told to sit up straight, to place the paper or book immediately in front of them, square with the sides of the desk, how to hold the sharpened pencil and where to start writing. Each letter had the same space as the letter written before writing the next. When later words were written, you placed your first finger on the left hand between the two words before writing the next, copying off the blackboard the lower case letters of the alphabet, filling the first page of the writing book with A. This copying out continued throughout the infant school and was given great significance. Joined up writing carried on in the juniors to the same degree of exactness. Individualism wasn't acceptable. The up and down strokes were to be on top of each other. Loops were banned. Each generation seemed to have their own preferences in letter writing form, with, the, with, with or without loops, continuing without space from the lower case to capitals. More paper covered, more notebooks used, row upon row of individual letters, repeating page after page, all designed to perfect, perfect the handwriting. Phonetics applied to every letter to standardise the spoken word. Great emphasis was laid on speaking the king's English. Another daily task was repeating multiplication tables by rote in a sing-song fashion every morning. On and on and on. It passed a great deal of time only to be interrupted by the air raid warnings. Music was taught using visual aids, tonic so far draped over the blackboard. Music pieces played on a wind-up record player and the tune picked out on the piano. A demonstration of variations within the piece, the time wrapped out on the desk with a ruler. Music increasingly became an important part of the curriculum. This was due to the government's recognition that it was impor an important discipline which could be transferred to all other subjects. Posters decorated the walls with multiplication tables, nursery rhymes and a nature scroll. There were painting lessons, highly coloured daubs with an almost hairless brush, reading Janet and John type books, fingers running along the page as each child was trying to read in turn. The school's air raid shelters were installed in 1940. There were large concrete pipes originally made for enclosing streams or sewers about six foot in diameter sunk into trenches in the ground. A bomb-proof entrance and exit steps built up at either end when the whole lot was covered in 18 inches of soil and then turfed over. Duck boards covered the floors and slatted forms provided seating at the sides. They were dimly lit, smelly, cold and damp, and when the sirens sounded, the children left their classes and streamed to the shelters, each class having their own place. Few lessons were taught or even attempted to be taught. The children sang many songs in the round, took part in general knowledge quizzes, and using the cotton reel with four small nails over which wool was looped, French knitting was produced.
Eventually a long knitted tail was made which was sewn together to make a round mat in turn could be further stitched together to make a rug. Wrapping wool round a cardboard ring with a hole cut into the centre was another craze. You continued threading wool round and round from the outside into the centre until the centre was totally filled up with wool. The outside edges were cut, the cardboard removed, producing a ball of wool. Infant school days consisted of many such air raids, which meant going down to the shelters where teachers tried to occupy the children by keeping them entertained. Elsie's children, Stan and Terry, were at Longfield Primary School. The class sizes in 1938-39 were between 25 to 30 children. The first class was the introduction class. A further three classes held a year difference between each. Similarly, upstairs, the junior school operated, operated the same class structure, years 8 to 9, 9 to 10 and 10 to 11. The schools had been built at the same time as the rest of the town, displaying the then modern style, brick walls, metal framed windows and a flat roof. All the furniture and equipment was new. The new secondary education system followed the then pattern voiced in the 30s that there should be different schools for different abilities and the children tested to decide which school system at the age of 11. All the children had their own gas masks in a square cardboard box equipped with a string shoulder strap. They had to line up at school and be taught how to put them on, take them off and what they felt like whilst doing some light exercise with them on. Very soon after the masks were issued, the Battle of Britain was fought. The fear of enemy troops landing diminished after Germany went to war with Russia. We were told gas masks need not be carried any longer, but must be kept near to hand, so that they were consigned to the cupboard under the stairs and never be got out again. Government propaganda abounded, using every form of media making the population aware of the seriousness of the national position that everyone should be prepared to do their best for the country and for those fighting abroad. Although adult conversation was about the war, children did not participate. Their talk was about the latest film from Hollywood, the latest action in the Beano Dandy or Comic Cuts, some sporting event, train number or swapped cigarette card. For life went on as if nothing had changed. As children, they never noticed or commanded on the lack of commented on the lack of men that used to be walking in the streets, that the shops and town streets were only populated by women. If boys dressed up to play, it was as cowboys or Indians, certainly not as Germans. The Hollywood films had a far greater influence. Radio news programs were highly censored, giving a report on the war's progress in line with the government's plans. Newspapers took their line from a similar agency, keeping in mind the necessity for keeping up morale. Everything was said and done to help the country's war effort. Programs such as Wilfred Pickles Have a Go Joe, Tommy Hanley's Itmar, Workers Playtime or Bombed Out were written to raise the national nation's spirits. Charles Hill, the radio doctor, had far more air time than any minister. The period of the Blitz was over. The Germans, before putting Operation Sea Line into action, the invasion of Britain, planned to put Britain's airfields and radar stations out of action, appreciating the need to smash our air force and its guidance systems. The RAF attacked the German bombers, forcing the German Luftwaffe to keep a large fighter escort. The raids on London continued, further draining Germany's resources, but most of all relieving the pressure on Britain's fighter airfields and radar installations. Eventually Hitler, Hitler put off all through the invasion, but instead marched into Russia and this heralded the end of the bits, particularly those raids towards inland sites. The school sh shelters fell into disrepair. The boys watched from their parents' windows 
London ablaze, the air raid sirens would start their interrupting, pulsating wail that told you to take cover. Approaching bombers were within range. The searchlight batteries would illuminate the night sky, flickering their beams of light about in a haphazard way, trying to locate the planes. The interrupted drone of the unsynchronized engines of the German bombers punctuated the night. Occasionally, the searchlight beams caught a bomber, making it look like a silver midget fly. The bombs would be exploding, making a dull crump, then flames would shoot up, eventually making the complete eastern sky glow orange and red, like a semicircular northern light spectacular. We could see, at first, the searchlight seeking out and occasionally lighting up an air enemy aeroplane the beams of light flickering across the sky forever probing for the aircraft then the ACAT guns firing trying to shoot the bombers down at night you could hear the pieces of shrapnel and spent cartridges falling onto the roof and finally the sirens would give the all clear by a continuous tone and the searchlights would begin to flicker out in the morning, it would be a rush to see who could find the biggest and the most interesting piece of shrapnel. The radio gave out the ingredients of new recipes, how to save scraps of food, to make further dishes, and how to conserve fuel and water. The radio doctor, Charles Hill, later to be Minister of Health, told the listeners how to make simple diagnostic tests and how to treat basic health problems, what to eat to keep healthy. He became an established radio celebrity, whose advice was avidly listened to and followed. He became a radio celebrity and an institution. The population was coping and becoming more frugal. There were tips on how to make clothes last longer. Clothes rationing, a separate clothing book, was introduced after food was dealt with in 1941. Early the, folly, the, early the following year, each person was allocated 60 coupons, which had to last for 15 months. People were encouraged to make do and mend. The government introduced the utility scheme designed to save material and much later this scheme involved all household goods and brought about the utility kite mark. By 1941 people began to get accustomed to the limited supply. They began to experiment with unusual food ingredients, imported tinned sausages and spam, powdered milk, eggs and potatoes. The household hardly ever had to resort to any of these new foods, although school meals included them. The new powdered potato and egg was tried out at school. It didn't catch on, and it was soon discarded. No one I know suffered being hungry or not having sufficient. The meals were eaten and often seconds dished out to those who wanted it. Being in ink monitor at school was a chore, for the reserve pot was large and heavy. Trying to fill the small inkwells was difficult and messy enough without having to retrieve them from each desk and return them filled up. All pupils were allocated a schoolhouse, which identified the member by a coloured diagonal band, especially recognisable for sports and team games. School assembly was held first thing in the main hall of the school. Mrs. Gotobed, a person who would easily find a place alongside Chalky of Giles' cartoon fame, would officiate. When the final announcements were made, we marched from the hall to the tune of a popular march, back to our respective classrooms. Each year the children had to parade in front of the visiting nurse to have their ears looked into and hair searched for lice. Co-educational primary education was completed without any streaming or selection. There were no behavioural problems exhibited towards others or against those in authority. Most children kept up with the rest of the class. There were few tests and the annual examination was internally examined. On Empire Day, the children were allowed to go to school in cub or brownie uniform. The Union Jack was flown on the flagpole and the national anthem sung. 
Even at home, if the anthem was played on the radio, one was almost made to feel disloyal if you didn't stand to attention. The playing of the national anthem outside the home was in theatres and cinemas, concerts hall or park, demanded total respect. No one would dream of being anti-royal or casting aspersions towards the hierarchy. King and country was maintained and claimed as the highest ideal. Much of the history lesson was devoted to the empire, how it was made up, how it was governed and who were the notable men. During music lessons, national songs from around Britain were learned and sang. Friday afternoons was the time when the teacher read the weekly story, Coral Island or Wind in the Willows, a great favourite. By reading these stories, the children were sufficiently interested to want to read them for themselves. School dinners were served in the hall. At some point in the year, the hall was divided up to accommodate overspilled classes. Some children went home for their meals. Milk was drunk from a third pint bottles with a straw in the morning break time. This social health supplement, supplement continued until 1971, when it was stopped for the over-sevens by the Conservative government of Mrs Thatcher. In the winter, the milk was frozen solid, and in the summer, warm, often to taste sour. In 1941, Stan enrolled in the local piano teacher's class. He practiced religiously, and throughout his many years of lessons, took the Royal College of Music exams. Two years later, Father asked Terry if he would like to learn too. To this he replied, no, keeping to myself that he didn't want to spend all this time practicing whilst friends were outside having fun. Bert was not insistent. He knew that if Terry didn't want to learn, he would not have to spend the fees. One of Stan's great wheezes, it may have come from stories during the war or through the scouts, whatever, his idea was that we should build an aerial ropeway from the bedroom window to the garden. The only rope long enough was the washing line, and this was secretly taken from its pole close to the fence and sneaked up to the bedroom, making sure that their mother didn't realise what was going on. The rope was stuffed up Terry's jumper. The bedroom window was flung wide open, one end of the washing line tied to one of the iron bedstead legs, paid out over the window sill, and the spare dropped to the ground. They casually went downstairs, out into the backyard, and using the mangle as an anchor, tied the spare end to it and drew the rope tight. Back they went upstairs to begin their descent, and Stan, being the organiser and senior, elected to descend first. There were, other than the poor quality of the rope, two main essentials to the success of this escapade. 1. The need for the rope to be tied firmly at the top, and 2. That the bottom is also firmly anchored to prevent swing. Allow the descending person to slide instead of to fall. The architect who designed the house believed that a semblance of balance was necessary in, the in his design. The doors and windows were in alignment, vertically and horizontally. Beneath the bedroom window were the French doors. After clambering out onto the sill, Stan gradually descended. It was here that the first safety feature was missing. The bed took up the strain. Their bedroom never had a carpet, but relied upon linoleum to offer a taste of luxury. The floor surface did not allow sufficient grip. The bed gradually slid towards the window. Perhaps if the second principle of safety had been accomplished, success might have been achieved. There again, if Terry had been strong enough to draw up the slack, there may have, that may have sufficed. Unfortunately, neither principle was met. The mangle, though of ancient lineage, still had the casters attached, and these were we found to be necessary for them to remove the mangle to the other end of the yard, but as an anchorage they proved less than favourable, and this is where, had there been complete reliance upon total grip, to use the expression much used by General Montgomery, help may have been to hand. It wasn't.
the mangle started to move towards the French windows, and the rope slackened. Stan, wishing to stop the rope from spinning and to give some semblance of order to his descent, pushed out his foot, which found purchase on the main French window, which gave way under pressure. Without going into too many details, Stan landed in a heap on the ground via the mangle. Elsie now took a greater interest in the proceedings and flew out of the kitchen. She didn't have the say that she could tell our father what we had been up to, for the results of our labours were obvious. It was normal for Terry to meet father at the railway station every evening. It was on their walks back home that Terry was able to get in his side of every I the story of every issue, straight before any nasty rumours were broadcast later on. In this case, it was to no avail, and even though the brothers took to the beech tree, Albert meant to have his say with the cane. Terry never enjoyed being up that tree, looking down on his father stalking about at the bottom with a strap or cane. Time was not always a good healer, and a visit to the doctor was never a pleasant pastime. The family doctor had his surgery up Pinner Road, just past the small line of shops. Dr. Mayer was a large-framed, loose-limbed Irishman who hardly ever moved from his swivel chair. His waiting room, to the left of the front door, was entered from a small hall. A small sign directed the patient to enter. As soon as you opened the waiting room door, a number of piercing eyes greeted you. Some appeared over newspapers, others myoptically through glasses. The women present looked up from their knitting. All were not all hostile, but mostly, certainly wary. You may be, after all, bringing in some ghastly disease. There was no means of knowing who was the last to enter. To know your place in the queue, you had to recognise all who were in there at the time you entered, and then using elimination, or, if you were bold, you just asked. It was very rare for this to happen. It certainly created uncertainty, which contributed to its own degree of nurse nervous anxiety, overlaying your already weakened state of health. This nervous atmosphere partly explains the anxious, piercing glances when you first arrived. There was only one seat available, next to a rather fat boy with glasses, who sniffed repeatedly, judging each sniff to a nicety to prevent total embarrassment. It was the only source of real entertainment, and either caused the, the onlooker to feel more sick, or drove them out of the room. The ill-hung lace curtains, behind full-length blackout curtains, covered the bay windows. The glass, crisscrossed with brown paper tape to prevent bomb blast, allowed very little light into the poorly lit room. Peeling posters and scuffed linoleum did nothing to entice the visitor to linger. The kitchen chairs ranged round the sides of the bleak room, allowed a, the group of coughing and sneezing patients to examine each other carefully over their magazines, each scrutinised carefully for signs of infectious disease or distressing habit. In the centre of a room, in the room, a green baize tablecloth covered the circular table which held a pile of ancient magazines. These gave only limited distraction to the desperate company of men wanting a chit to enable them to take time off work, women who needed someone to take an interest in their nervous condition, and children to obtain a school absentee note. Posters advertised the horrors of measles, mumps and TB, the government's latest warnings showing an owl situated, silhouetted against a yellow moon, declared talk cost lives, the only cheerful decoration. The low wattage bulb, its illuminate qu quality severely restricted by a fringed coolie hat shade, attempted to offer some much needed light. The wartime patients, as they waited to act on the summons of the piercing bell, held themselves in readiness. The shrill call caused a response, some to almost fall off their seats, others to stand only to sit down again as someone else beat them to the door.
a third who nervously twitched and shook in response to the clamour. The rattling striker of the distressed bell emitted, emitted a throttled bring. The assembled company came to life, their hearts pounding. The next patient, checking his position in the order of entry, lurched to his feet. Placing his magazine carefully on the table, attempted to leave the room unseen and unheard, his trailing scarf dragging on the floor. Knocking briefly on the consulting room door, a muffled come-in allowed the next in line to enter. The scene was one of chaos. Every surface of his room was filled to overflowing with strewn papers, sample dishes, stethoscope, mirror, mi microscope, torch, ruler and bottles of pills, packets of powders and bottles of pink-coloured jollop. Dr. Mayer started to write out a prescription before you had even taken your seat. "'What can I do for you, son?' His Irishness was pronounced. The dentist over the road left one with the opposite impression. The dentist, Mr. Hudson, was the very antithesis of Dr. Mayer, for he was short, erect and slim, quick of action and slow to rile. He operated a belt-driven drill with the dexterity of a diamond cutter. Its rotating belt spun round as the coarse drill ground in. Today, the revolutions per minute would admirably suit drilling through brickwork.